everybody, and welcome to my talk about WordPress dynamic blocks, customizing Gutenberg without living in fear of validation errors. My name is Joni Hallaby, and just a little bit about me. I am a web developer at Georgetown University. I've been with Georgetown for about five years. I am a mom to a very adorable three-year-old, and outside of both of those two things, I am a runner, and I am a reader, and I am a really bad ukulele player, but I'm still learning. So let's do a little bit of expectation setting. Uh, so this is a technical talk for developers, specifically WordPress developers. I'm going to be talking quite a bit about JavaScript and PHP. So knowing those languages will be really, really helpful. And also knowledge of how to create blocks in Gutenberg, the WordPress uh, block editor is also very helpful. Not 100% required, but it will make things easier. All right, so how did, how did this start? Where did this talk come from? Um, at Georgetown, uh, about three or four years ago, we had all of our websites on Drupal and we decided that we really wanted to move off of Drupal and move into WordPress. And this was about the time when WordPress was really getting WordPress 5 into gear and there was a lot of talk about the Gutenberg editor. And we got very excited about this editor. Um, so when we decided to migrate from Drupal into WordPress, we also decided to just full on embrace Gutenberg, even though at that point it was still an alpha. Um, we had a lot of ideas and a lot of specific requirements from our content editors. So there was a need very early on for us to create custom blocks for our content editors to use. Um, and also at that point, I had never worked in React and the Gutenberg API was super, super new. So we were learning both React and the Gutenberg API kind of on the go as we were creating a lot of these custom blocks. Um, so I just want to start with a very simple example of something that um, we were working on. Um, so once upon a time, names are made up here. But Jordan, who manages the library site, uh, came over and asked for a block that can display a book title and the book's author. Very, very simple. So, all right, no problem. That is a great request. We can create a custom Gutenberg block for that. So we are going to create what we are going to call the book block. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to create the book block in a very, very standard way. And this is the way that's documented on uh, the WordPress, uh, the WordPress site, the WordPress documentation there. Um, so step one is you have to register the block. And all registration does is letting WordPress know that this block exists and it needs to be displayed in the block inserter. Um, so we do that in the JavaScript. Uh, I like working with modules. So these top lines up here, I'm importing some edit and save functionality that's going to come into play later. So I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, but this main module is registering the actual book block itself. So I am calling a function called register block type, which is coming from the WP, WP blocks library. Uh, I'm namespacing it, my terrible namespacing, so sorry, but you can namespace your blocks with whatever you'd like. Um, at Georgetown, we actually just namespace our blocks with GU. Um, and the actual machine name of my block is book. Uh, so then I can go in and I can give my new book block a title, book, a description, a category, just to help uh, content editors find my block a little bit easier when they're going through the block inserter. Uh, nice little icon to make it look pretty. And here I am registering my blocks attributes. So attributes are the pieces of data that go into creating a block. So in this case, Jordan asked for a block that can display a book's title and author. So I have two attributes, one for the title and one for the author, and both of these attributes are just very simple text attributes. Um, and then when you register a block, finally, uh, you're required to have two functions. One is the edit function that will write the UI in the WordPress editor 
um, so that a content editor can go in and enter all the information that they need for a block. And the other is the save function. And the save function is the function that writes out all the front end markup. So for both of these, uh, for both of these functions, I am calling uh, separate modules, my edit and my save modules. So let's go into those modules and see how they work. Uh, so first off, I want to talk about uh, that edit module and adding, adding the editor UI. Um, so this is my book edit module. I'm passing in my uh, blocks properties. And I'm getting a couple of WordPress packages, um, a text control, which will just give me a very nice uh, text input field, and fragment, which is kind of, uh, think of it as Gutenberg API's uh, equivalent of the div tag. It's just a very useful container um, that you can put all of your UI elements in because React, for those of you who are not super familiar with React, when you return some markup, everything has to be in a single um, element. You can't just have like multiple elements that are getting saved at the top level. Um, they all have to be contained in one singular element. So fragment is a really, really useful element for that. Um, so next I'm getting my block properties. Um, set attributes is a common function uh, that the Gutenberg API provides that lets you save data to your block attributes. And here I'm just pulling out my uh, the two attributes that I declared in my registration function, title and author. Um, setting some on-change uh, callbacks. So when my title changes, I save the new value for my title. When my author changes, I save the new uh, value for my author using both of these use that set attributes function. And then here I'm returning my editor markup. So like I said, everything has to be in a single um, element. So I'm using my fragment element for that. And I just have two text controls. So one is for my title. So I'm passing it in the value in that on change uh, function. And I have a very similar one for my author. And then uh, step three is creating our front end markup using that save module that I was talking about earlier. So my save module is super, super simple. Um, even if you don't know React, this probably looks really straightforward. Um, I am passing it in props. I'm extracting my title and my author property or my author attributes. Um, and I am returning just straight up HTML and I'm putting my title and my author in their own individual P tags and done. Uh, so this is what my editor interface looks like. So these uh, two text boxes are uh, coming straight out of that text control. And then this is what my front end looks like. So I, as you might remember from the uh, save module, uh, both my title and my author are just being output in P tags. So I have my title and my author, super straightforward. Uh, so our story continues. We show this block to Jordan and Jordan loves it. It's wonderful, but we get some feedback that it looks a bit plain and you know what, they're right. It does look a bit plain. <laughs> Um, so Jordan comes back and asks, like, you know what, like, can we change the title so maybe it's a header instead of a paragraph that might make more sense semantically, uh, it might look a little better. So we say, you know what, sure, that's a super easy change. Um, going back to our HTML, we just have to change that P tag to a heading tag, right? Easy. So we update our book block and we update that markup in our save function. And we just settled on an H3 tag. So let's change that P tag for our title attribute to be an H3 instead. Uh, so here is the updated markup that our save function is going to return. So our H3 is in here. This is looking really good. We're pretty confident about this. Super simple change. But when I go to edit my page, this is what I see. Um, so the Gutenberg editor doesn't really like the fact that we changed the save markup. Um, so it says, you know what, this is unexpected. I don't know what just happened. You just changed the code and I wasn't expecting you to change that code and I'm not very happy about that. That's, that's basically what this screen is saying. And this is basically 
a block validation error, which is something that is kind of annoying, not super pretty. Um, but let's talk through what a block validation error actually is. Um, so what happens is, well, first of all, this is a screenshot of my uh, developer console, and it kind of steps through what the Gutenberg editor is really looking at. So it's saying, you know what, I'm trying to validate this block. I'm trying to make sure that this book block, book block is what I expect it to be. And it's not because I'm taking a look at what is saved and what I'm expecting. And I'm expecting Charlotte's Web, which is my book title, to be in a P tag. And now you're telling me it's supposed to be in an H3 tag. And I am super confused. Um, and basically, this is this is the pinnacle of block validation. Um, Gutenberg likes to make sure that the blocks front end, um, the code that the block, block the, the block save function is generating is what it expects it to be. So what does that really mean? Um, Gutenberg goes through a validation process where when you enter the uh, block editor or the, the post editor screen, um, it pre-renders all the blocks using what the current save function is and the block at uh, attribute data. So in the case of our book, book block, it is taking uh, the two block attributes, our title and our author, and it's looking at the save function and it's saying, okay, well, you are telling me that the title should be in an H3 and the author should be in a paragraph. So great. Now I'm going to compare this to what um, I, as the Gutenberg editor, I am going to compare this code to what I saved in the database the last time you edited this block. Um, and if those two, um, if those two pieces of code match, then great, we are ready to roll. We can just go on editing like any other normal day. But if it doesn't match, it will look for any known deprecations. Um, so let's take a look at what's in the database before I get into deprecations. Um, so in the database, um, a block is saved um, in within a set of HTML comments. This is kind of how Gutenberg deals with uh, saving uh, saving the block data without making too many changes to what the um, what the database structure was before WordPress five, before Gutenberg really became the main editor. So what this first line here in my comment says is this block is the block that is namespaced my and it is called book. And here are my um, attributes. My title is my title attribute is Charlotte's Web. My author attribute is E.B. White. And then outside of this comment, it uh, saves the actual markup. So it saves my container div and both my title and my author in both p tags because this is how this block got saved the last time I uh, made a change to the page that this this block exists on. So my timeline is basically, I created the block, I um, created a page and added this block to it. I added my title and my author. At that point, they were both in P tags. And then I saved this page. And then I made that change that Jordan requested to change the title into an H3. And let's remember, this is now our save markup. Our save markup is saying that our title is in this H3 tag. So there is a mismatch. Um, Gutenberg is actually seeing this mismatch, and that is why we're getting that block validation error. Because in the database, the title is in that paragraph, and in my save markup right now, my title is in an H3. Um, so I mentioned deprecations before. Deprecations are a way of telling the Gutenberg editor what all the previous versions of a particular block is so that WordPress can use those previous versions to validate any blocks that have been updated. So it's basically saving like version, uh, version history of your block save function. And you can create a block deprecation object and add it straight into your registration function. So this is what um, this is what a deprecation object looks like. Um, it's basically just an array of objects. You can have as many deprecations as you want, 
And these deprecations include both the attributes object and the save function. And these are the old versions of both your attributes and your save functions. Um, the deprecation object is required to have both the attributes object and the save function, even if you didn't make a change to both of these things. Uh, so for example, I just changed um, the save function for our book lock to enclose the title in that H3 tag. So I need my save function here to say, hey, there was a previous version that saves my title in a P tag. But this deprecation object really also needs to know what the attributes um, are. So we still need, we still need this um, attributes object up here. So every time you change the expected output, so every time you change a blocks save function, you need to create this new deprecation object item. Otherwise, you're going to get a block validation error the next time somebody goes in and, and edits a page that has an old version of your block on it. And that's kind of a pain. <laughs> um, we ran into uh, this issue a lot. Um, we like to make changes to blocks all the time. So we were running into this issue a lot. And sometimes the deprecation objects can get pretty complicated if you're making very, very complicated changes to your blocks. So we made this discovery that we can make our blocks dynamic. And this solves the issue of needing deprecation object when we change the way a block is saved, the, the way the block renders the front end. And our solution is to create a dynamic block, um, which is beautiful. But you're probably wondering right now, what on earth is a dynamic block? Um, so let's define the two kinds of blocks that we have within Gutenberg. So a static block is what I just stepped you through um, in terms of the creation of our book block. So a static block, the block is registered in the JavaScript. Uh, the front end markup is created by a JavaScript save function, and that markup is saved directly to the database as part of the post content. A dynamic block, on the other hand, the block is actually registered within both the JavaScript and the PHP. Um, and only the block attribute data is actually saved to the database. So if you remember that comment that was at the top of um, the block when I showed you the, the what's actually stored in the database, that block attribute data is actually the only thing that gets saved in the database. There is no markup that is actually saved to the database. And instead, the front end markup is rendered by the PHP instead of the JavaScript. So this means that the uh, the markup, the front end code for these blocks are actually rendered on the fly as you access a page. But it means that there's no markup saved to the database, which means that when you change the front end code for this, since there's nothing there's no markup that actually needs to be compared to in the database. It doesn't make the comparison. And it just says, OK, if the PHP is taking care of it, that's great. I don't care if you change the markup. And there, it, these blocks don't really go through the same validation process that a static block goes through. So you don't get validation errors when you change the front end markup. So let's go through an example of how to create a dynamic block. And we're just gonna update our book block to go through that example. So book block take two, we're gonna turn book block into a dynamic block. Um, we're gonna make a series of small changes to do that. So the first change that we need to make is how book block gets registered and rendered. And both of those things happen in the PHP. So I'm gonna create a PHP file and I like classes. So I'm going to create a book class um, in my uh, construct function. I am going to add an action on init to register my block. And I'm going to use this function called register block type to do a lot of the same things that we saw in the JavaScript version of the block registration. So I'm going to give my book block a machine name called my slash book. I'm 
going to actually move the declaration of my block attributes from the JavaScript into the PHP here. So I'm declaring both of my attributes, my title and my author. They are both of type string. And um, this register block type function also requires a render callback to let the block know how to render this function on the front end. So my render callback is going to be another function in this book class called render, which is right down here. So my render function looks very, very similar to the save function uh, that we saw on the JavaScript side. So I am pulling out my block attributes, I'm pulling out my title and my author, and I am returning some very simple HTML, my container div, and then my title in the H3 and my author inside a P tag. And done, that's it for our PHP. Um, so now we need to go back and make a couple of changes to the JavaScript part of this block. So I'm gonna do two things here. I am going to remove the attribute declaration uh, from the JavaScript registration function because I just did that in my PHP. And I'm actually gonna update my save function uh, to return null instead of any actual markup. Um, so this becomes my new uh, registration in, on the JavaScript side. So again, I'm registering my block just as I did before with machine name, title, description, category, and icon. I have my same edit function that I did before. Uh, we removed the attributes from here and now my save function returns null. You might be wondering why I even bother with a save function. Um, like why have a save function that just returns null? Like why can't I just delete it? Um, the save function is actually required by the Gutenberg API, so it needs to exist. Um, having the save function returns returning null basically tells this block, okay, don't save any markup in the database, and it implies that the PHP side will take care of it. Um, you might also be wondering, because I've had these questions, why, um, why do we need to register the block on both the JavaScript and the PHP side? Um, and that is basically because the, the Gutenberg editor is just a giant React app. So we need to keep the registration um, function on the JavaScript side to let the editor know that this block exists, to let the um, uh, block inserter know that this block exists. Because if you don't register your block in the JavaScript, it will never show up in the block inserter. And then we need to register the function on the PHP side to make sure the PHP side knows that it exists so that it can render it dynamically and that we can uh, register that render callback. Um, so these are my changes to my JavaScript. Um, step three is literally nothing. Um, the only thing left in this block is the edit functionality and that stays as is. Um, we don't need to edit the editor, the edit function because again, like I just said, the Gutenberg editor is a React app. So that edit function needs to remain on the JavaScript side and it doesn't need to change because right now we're not making any changes to the uh, editing capabilities of this book block. So let's take a look at what this block looks like on the editor. Looks exactly the same. We still have our title and our author um, uh, attributes uh, exposed here inside those same text controls. So perfect, nothing here changes. Um, and now on our, on our front end, we have our new markup that is now being rendered by the PHP instead of our JavaScript. Uh, Charlotte's Web, which is the title of our book, is now being rendered as an H3, and E.B. White, our author, is being rendered in a paragraph tag. So perfect. This is exactly what Jordan asked for, and this is now a dynamic block, so this, um, this block can work and it can be changed later on if we really need to, and we don't have to worry about any more block deprecation errors. Um, so let's take a look at what's happening behind the scenes. Um, so in the database, um, this is it. 
this is literally it. Um, we simply have our uh, Gutenberg-esque formatted comment that says, hey, I am a block. I My machine name is my slash book. And I have um, two attributes, this title attribute and this author attribute. And all of this is within the comment, um, the Gutenberg comment. And there's no more markup that is actually being saved in our database. So we take this back to Jordan and Jordan loves it. But as every stakeholder, I am sure you know, has always said, can we make another change? Uh, so Jordan comes back and says, you know what? It might be nice to have a summary of the book um, in our book block too. But now, you know what? We're feeling really confident. Our book block is now dynamic. We can make changes way more easily without worrying about having any validation errors or writing a deprecation object. So we say, yes, this is super easy. And we really mean it this time. So let's go through this one more request really quickly. Book block version three. So we're gonna add a new attribute called a summary attribute. And now that our block is dynamic, we're gonna add it into the PHP. Uh, we'll update our PHP render function so that it will print out uh, whatever is in that summary attribute. And we need to add a new control to our um, editor UX, which is in remains in the JavaScript. All right, so let's break this down. Step one, let's focus on the PHP first. So we're going to update our attributes um, to add a new summary attribute, which is also going to be of type string. Um, so easy peasy. Uh, let's update our render function. So we're going to pull out our summary um, attribute from, at, from attributes that's getting passed in. And we're just going to print the summary in a regular paragraph tag. Um, and now let's move on to step two. Step two, we need to update our JavaScript to add a new control in the edit function so that a content editor can go in and actually type in a summary in our book block. Uh, so this time we thought, you know what, a summary, it might be nice to have this be rich text as opposed to just regular old plain text because maybe our summary uh, parts of it maybe need to be bolded or italicized. Maybe we need to add a link to the summary. That might be a stretch because it's just a summary, but you never know. A summary, we can have a little bit more freedom in terms of what can go into that summary attribute. So we're going to get another um, um, another control here called the, the rich text control, and that's actually coming from our block editor library. I'm going to update the properties that I'm pulling out from or the attributes, pardon me, uh, that we're pulling out from our um, from our block properties. Uh, I'm gonna add another on change callback for our summary now. Um, looks very similar to the ones that we already have for title and author. And here, scrolling down to the edit markup, I now have a rich text um, a rich text control in here. Um, that is uh, taking the value as our summary attribute. I'm passing it in um, my on change callback. And I'm saying, you know what? People can, people can have bold text in here. They can have italicized uh, text in here. Rich text also supports a uh, link and I believe strike through. Never really liked strike through. I don't know why, personal preference. Um, and link. Now that I'm thinking about it, it doesn't really make sense for a book summary, so we'll just leave that out. So people can bold and italicize, and we think that's good enough. Um, and that's it for the changes that we need to make to add this summary. Um, this screenshot shows um, the updated editor UI, so we still have our title and our author uh, fields as text controls. And then below that, all of this text, uh, some pig, humble, radiant, these are the words. Um, all of that is coming from our rich text control that is housing our summary. Um, and you can see I have some, some italicized text in here because why not? Um, and now this screenshot is also showing our new front end. Um, so in addition to our title and our author, we now have our summary that's being displayed on the front end. And if you'll notice, just going back to the editor, um, 
for a second. There's no deprecation error. There's no, you need to recover your block. Um, there's no issues whatsoever um, because that comparison that's happening with the block validation um, is just automatically passing because this is now a dynamic block. So just a quick recap. Um, there are two kinds of blocks that you can declare when you are creating new blocks for the WordPress editor, uh, static blocks and dynamic blocks. And static blocks really are wonderful. They're great for um, very, very static blocks, like blocks that you know contain static data that will not change. You know that your markup is not going to change if you're very confident about that, or you're just like, okay, fine. If it changes, it might be a rarity. I can handle a deprecation every now and then. It, the static block is great. But if you know you're writing a block and later on down the line, you know that um, front end markup is going to change or you're going to add more attributes, um, you're going to need to declare uh, Depre uh, deprecation object items um, as you make those changes in your static block. Um, dynamic blocks can avoid this, and they're super, su super useful in those situations where you have a static block that you know is going to change and evolve over time, or if your requirements are changing constantly. Um, they're really useful for situations like that, and we at Georgetown, we found ourselves in that situation a lot, which is how, which is how we got here. Um, and actually, as a side note, dynamic blocks are also absolutely the way to go if you have dynamic data. That's actually why this whole process exists in the first place. Um, so if you're creating a block that is pulling um, the latest posts from a given category, you definitely want to go the dynamic front because you know those lists of posts are going to change um as more posts get added to your site let's say that you have a blog and you want to grab the last five posts about cats and I, yes i know that there is a core block that does that but let's say you want to create your own um the dynamic block is definitely the way to go because you know your markup and you know your data is going to be changing all the time um so that is it. Uh, these slides are available on the internet right now at talks.jhalaby, that's my first initial and last name, dot com slash dynamic dash blocks. So feel free to go back, review these slides whenever you'd like. Um, also, um, I have all of the example code that I use to create um, both the static and dynamic versions of our book block. Um, those are also available on my GitHub. If you take a look at my slides, it will be way easier for you to get to these links than me trying to say them. Um, or are you trying to frantically write them right now? Um, so go to my slides, grab, grab the slide and click on the links if you'd like to see the actual code for the examples in this talk. And lastly, thank you so, so much. Um, I am available on Twitter at Joni Hallaby, uh, on GitHub at that dev girl. And you can find me on my website. I post very, very occasional blog posts at jhallaby.com. Um, seriously, feel free to get in touch if you have any questions about this talk, or if you just wanna talk about Gutenberg and, WordPress. I am always open up for conversations. Thank you again so much and have a great rest of your day.